Get your Bible. We're going to do a little talking about, well, character and charisma. A wonderful thing. It's a subject we've been talking about somewhat. But my premise in these talks is, uh, as I started out last night, yesterday, the last one, is to more than suggest to, to affirm that the evidence at hand from the writings of evangelical reformists and theologians Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians, all the traditional churches. That their official theological manuals have shortchanged the resurrection somewhat, which we discussed yesterday too. But unfortunately, the the uh, up up until now, Pentecostal and Charismatic leadership circles have not produced. Uh, Unless I'm missing some, but the, over the last 20 years they have more, more so. But, but they need some theological framework for the resurrection and the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. It's almost like we experienced it before we explain it. That's not going to do. It won't do. We have to give. We have to be able to give a reason for the hope that's in us. We can't go around expecting people to accept what we have, because we say we have it. They have a right to the documentary type of evidence that they. Ought to have what we have. When the first people at the turn of the century that hungry for the Holy Spirit, they did so from the Word of God. They read it. Tory, I missed that yesterday. It's out of print, but it's not out of print. You can get it online about the Holy Spirit. And I was, he said I was studying the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and as I was studying it, I wondered, did anybody in my generation get the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Did he actually receive the Holy Spirit? And there have been many people, especially I read about the people who sat in his classes, in Tory classes in Los Angeles. He heard Dr. Tory say this in one of his classes. He said this. When he recognized his need for the Holy Spirit, he went to a study one night, to his study, and, and these were his actual words. When he came to at 4 o'clock in the morning, he knew he had been visited by God. He <laughs> received the Holy Spirit. There's a great need, uh, documented backgrounds, so that we're not going around selling out experience. Those first Pentecostals got their basis for experience out of the Word. And I think that's where we made a mistake. I preached it for a long time, but and it's happening now more and more. And uh, we told these people about our experience, and they got a second-hand experience instead of getting a first-hand experience from the Word. And that's when you go around the country, you find a bunch of jerkers and jumpers and switchers and this is a ball back to town. More so now, it's just great. You know, they baptized the Holy Spirit by the Word of God. And, and uh, I started out, there was a bunch of, there's a lot of weird things. And you found out the person who came there before you, who's a jumper and a squeaker or whatever, they received the Holy Spirit like this. Now, I want to talk about the whole point about the resurrection. Here's a couple quotes. Now, this is this is a, a lengthy quote. And, uh, and just listen to it. In examining the earliest Christian message recorded in the book of Acts, it is clear that the apostolic testimony was focused on the resurrection. To believe the gospel specifically meant to believe that God raised and exalted the crucified Jesus. Now, right here I want to say this. This is no indictment of anybody present, anybody listening to this, but evangelical altar calls are made on the basis of the cross most of the time. They're not made on the basis of the resurrection. And, yeah, it's true. The basis of the, basis of the cross is there. The apostles' appeal for the response is not made on the cross. It was made on the basis of the resurrection. All the apostles. We've seen that before. We'll see it again. The first evangelist who claimed that the resurrection of Christ secure salvation and forgiveness and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the gospel is also associated with the resurrection. Now, in its broadest scope, the gospel concerns the entire Christ event, and certainly the, the death and resurrection event. But the resurrection event itself, like no other aspect of the Christ uh, uh, Christ event encapsulated the gospel. Now the apostles understood the meaning of Christ's death from the vantage point of the resurrection. Apart from the resurrection, the death of Jesus would have been nothing but senseless, obscene tragedy. It would have been. 
There was a word placed on it. The resurrection turned night into day for the apostles. They then interpreted in the light of interpreted everything in the light of the resurrection. In the first resurrection enthusiasm, they didn't appear to have a theology of the death of Christ. They didn't even they didn't appear to even make the simple affirmation of his die for our sins. He didn't, they didn't say that. Just as it took time for the apostles to realize that the resurrection faith meant that they had to to restore the restriction, they had to ignore the restrictions of the law to the outreach of the Gentile. Gentile, don't talk to the Gentiles, they were told. So they took more time to, to receive the resurrection, more and more. It's the resurrection that rested uh, Calvary with meaning. It's not vice versa. If there had been no resurrection, there would have been no value in the de death of Christ. He would, uh, it would have been an act of his heroic love. He would have loved us, but it would have remained an act of that failed to achieve its goal. And at this point, Paul is explicit about this. If Christ is uh, not risen, if he's not raised, no sins are forgiven. You're dead. You know, died and trusted Christ, died in vain. And they're doomed. Now, you, that's the whole point of the gospel. It's not that he died for your sins on the cross. He did that. But if he wouldn't have rose from the dead, you wouldn't be saved. That was the whole point. Not going to leave his body to corruption. He's not going to stink. He won't leave his soul in hell, it said. Well, that was the whole crux of the thing. Is the new man. The new man. The resurrection. Hadn't been talked about very much. Now, those are Paul's words. Apart from the resurrection, Christ's death has no value. I told you, there were thousands and thousands of people crucified during that time. Uh, the resurrection was the, the, the highlight of the, the whole crux of the salvation. There had been no death on Christ's part, no self-emptying love, and there's no saving act of resurrection. It's just another crucifixion. That's quite proper, therefore, to ascribe to his self-giving sacrifice all that was achieved by the resurrection. That was it. He achieved, he achieved so much. There should be no fear about the resurrection. Uh, resurrection theology, centered theology, should it should eclipse theology of, of the cross. Now, I don't think you need to minimize Christ's death in the interest of emphasizing his resurrection. They both have to go together. It's a resurrection light which glorifies Calvary. It means something. Let me read one more thing to you. Everything that Jesus did and spoke on earth is, is now determined to the church for his resurrection. It's not... It's not the figure of Jesus who wandered through the fields of Galilee. And it's not the historical picture of the Nazarene, which forms the content of Paul's preaching. It is the living Lord who he has been exalted at the right hand of God. and He's out of this humiliation in his body. And now he's the Lord of the church. He's a man sitting in heaven. Now, when you're reading this, any of it, New Testament scholars especially, when they do in-depth studies and exegetical work, and linguistic research elsewhere in the text, uh, far above me, but I, I read them. It, it constantly occurs, though, especially when you're studying Paul. Why did Paul make so little of Jesus' life? That's what you read. Now, some scholars go so far as that maybe Paul didn't know much about Jesus and didn't know much about his life. I don't think it's true. Paul's pretty intense. I think he knew everything the gospel writers knew and more. But why didn't he make much out of that? I, I, I think because, as we, show, we saw last time, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, were events on the road to resurrection. I also know this. The Holy Spirit spoke to me over 40 years, and he's spoken into my life. Not all the time, and not, not as often as I wished he would. I have had some lengthy conversations with him where he didn't talk back. And then at other times, he just started talking. I know that Paul knew him. I know that Paul knew him and met him on the road to Damascus, and it wasn't. It was a different, different Jesus. It was a resurrected Jesus. He's an apostle, not of the Lamb, as we had so often heard it, but he is an apostle after the resurrection. A very powerful thing. He was given, in my opinion, but it's not just my opinion. You know, I read it though. Uh, the revelation of the church. I mean, Peter said it was hard. It's hard. Paul's stuff is hard to read. Well, Paul had and was given to him by the Holy Spirit, not by man, but by God himself, the revelation. So I know that he talked to him. I know that he knew Jesus, and he knew him well, but he knew him in his power. He didn't know him in his passion. 
in that death walk. He knew him in his power, in his resurrected state. He knew all the things that went with it, and he was given the understanding of the principles and the, the doctrine of rights that we have, the judicial things that he went through for us, what happened in heaven for us, before the foundation of the world, before any of us were born. These things were done. Uh, Jesus made it very clear to him that he, because he would go into different synagogues and situations, but he'd always go to the synagogues first, I think because Jesus told him to. Because if I don't, I don't, knowing him, if you've been beat up that much and hurt that much, and he loved his brethren. He said so. He'd give his whole life up if they all come to Christ. He loved his brothers. I think they beat him on a regular basis. They beat him, just stoned him to death. Beat him. It's, that man was a scar when he would get done. I would have said to, to hell with the, the Jews there. I'm not going in there. Every time I go into the temple someplace, in some temple, some synagogue, they beat me up. So you started seeing that the Holy Spirit would speak to him, and he would stay in one place for a while and lead them all to Christ, the ones that were going to come. And the Holy Spirit would say, I got all, that's all that's mine. That's it. So I know, and I've heard and read and, and say, when I came to Christ, when I came to Christ, when I came to Christ. It's after the resurrection. You didn't come to Christ. You and Christ fought. And then Christ what? Jesus won the, won the battle. I didn't come to Jesus. I wasn't looking for Jesus. Jesus was after me. And he came and got me. And it's a wonderful thing how I was born again into the kingdom of God. A tremendous testimony. And I don't give it very often, but it was a tremendous testimony. It has never quit to this day. Not one time. All right. Paul, to Paul, Christ Christ in the cross is important to Paul, but the Christ to be preached was the Christ of the resurrection on this side of it, on this side of Calvary and uh, the resurrection side. Well, well, Paul doesn't make a lot out of Jesus' earthly life. It's not that he doesn't acknowledge that or doesn't know about it. He just moved from the incarnation. He moved through the impeccable life, the wonderful life, into the vicarious life that, of the resurrection. He goes there. That's where he went. He went into a permanent enthronement for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now Paul's whole, Paul's whole emphasis is this, and he said that Christ did all that. That was necessary as, and to get him ready for what he is permanently. I don't preach the Christ in the cradle myself, and Christmas is a wonderful time, but I don't. that's not what I preach, and that's not what I minister in the Christmas message. Let's go to the cradle and let's look at him now. The baby in the cradle is a wonderful thing, but it doesn't do anything for you. It gets you crying a little bit. I want to see you. I want to see Jesus walk on water. Now, let's go to the bottom line of this deal. When John the Baptist, the greatest prophet that ever lived in the old economy, when John the Baptist announces the coming of the coming one's coming, you know, Jesus coming. He said, when he shall come, when he shall come, he shall do miracles for you, right? He's going to walk on water for you. He's going to raise the dead for you. He'll be sick. He's going to feed thousands at a time. He didn't say that. He didn't even say he'll die on the cross for you. John didn't say that at all. There was a kind of hint at it. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But that's not the bottom line yet. The coming one... Uh, he's going to rise from the dead for you. Nope. He didn't say any of this stuff. Not even a cent for you. He went to the bottom line of the deal and said this. And the finished redemptive work of Christ. And he said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. Wow. Does that mean there's no place for the incarnation? No. But I think all of these are intermediary works and events in the transition of the completion act of, of Christ uh, being raised from the dead. The one that we cre preach now, the one we preach now is Christ victorious at the right hand of God the Father. You can save us to the uttermost because he ever liveth to make intercession for us forever. Get us all there. Every one of us is never going to quit. Stay in there doing a job. That's rough. Now, and I thought about that over 2,000 years. Wow. Now, incidentally, the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church, and I shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, ignore these historical bodies. These churches, East, Eastern Orthodox Church, probably more than the Western Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church, they had a great 
place for the resurrection. Well, they did. And they walked in all the light they had, so we have to watch this. And their greeting was this, Christ is risen, that's a greeting. The ministers say, Christ is risen, and the congregation say, Christ is risen indeed. And that's, that's their Ether, Eastern Orthodox uh, punch word there. And even to this day, they have a dimension in God that's interesting. And uh, Anyway, I, I babble. Back in the early part of the century when communism was taking over Russia pretty hard, they had these indoctrinated, clever Russian apologists and agitators, really, brainwashers and going to teach you, and, and uh, indoctrinators. And they were going around the country gathering people together, get, get big crowds together, and throw them up on the back of a uh, wagon and get these peasants lined up. And part of their propaganda was to talk about about communism, and they realized the church had to be something to get rid of, and after 75 years, they realized they have to have the church back because there's no morality in communism whatsoever. Now, one of these clever operators, these fellows, he just finished, he delivered what he thought was a very brilliant, unanswerable diatribe against Christianity, you know, this rhetoric, and he looked around as much as to say, there, I've wiped it out now, my speeches are brilliant. And he said, is there anybody here who'd like to respond to what I just said? And one of these little old Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Russian women with a little bushka waddled up to the front and turned around to the crowd and said this, and, and uh, raised her hand and said this, Christ is risen. And the crowd indeed, of course, he is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. So, so much for that. And they always had a good underground church there, still do. They met many. Prophesied over many about what was coming. Now, that was a communist. And uh, communism is, is going to go broke yet anyway. We got a lot of bad news. Thank you for the good news. Thank God. Now, officially in communist circles right now, and, and they're trying to stuff them out again off and on, but they keep open them back up to keep some values going. Now, America needs to do that now, too, huh? Let's get with the program. We have more and more, more and more people that are taking the call, and I thank God for that. There are millions that have got baptized in the Holy Spirit and coming forth in that, but there are millions and millions more that Jesus wants. They have to get filled with the Holy Spirit. They must in these last days to obey Christ and to fight off the horrors of hell that are coming. There are things that, look, there are going to be people that are going to know they're being attacked by demon spirits and fallen angels. They know that now cause, because their time is short. They don't care anymore. You can look at our society right now and you can see it. The erosion of our liberties is, are uh, being hacked apart. Our rights are being destroyed. We Christians have been asleep for several years. Too long. Too long. And then you go, you, you go so far and you have to really fight to get back. Any of it. Now, let's go through the acts real quick. And uh, let's just get your Bible out and jot down some scriptures if you want to. But let's talk about this first. The witness to uh, apostles. The witness and the apostleship. Acts one twenty two. Ju Judas, as you recall, disqualified himself as an apostle because he lied. It was mean. <laughs> he, he betrayed our Lord Jesus and threw the money down. Oh, I betrayed a Innocent blood. The Bible said he went to his own place. Whatever that means. Interesting, interestingly enough, that Judas was a devil from the beginning. That was always interesting to me. And why did Jesus pick him? Why did God, Father, God the Father, told Jesus to pick him? Did he know he was a devil? Oh yeah. He wasn't just Jesus chosen. It wasn't the Father gave him to Jesus. The Father did give him to Jesus. You know, you have to really think about it. Jesus didn't look around at the disciples and say, tomorrow morning, I'm going to pick some disciples tomorrow morning. He was up in the mountains. And, what, now it was his nightly custom talking to the Father. And the Father said, son, it's time's come that I want you to have some men around you that will be with you. You'll need them to perfect your humanity. You need an impulse of Peter, and you need a, a, a doubting Thomas, and and uh, I got a selection for you. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I bet. 
And if you look at it, you'll go, why did you do that? Jesus said, okay, I'll do exactly what you want, what you have in mind. And he said, let's start out with Peter. And he said, the Peter? Peter? <laughs> yeah, that Peter. Uh -huh. Then he got around to Judas, and he said, Judas Iscariot. And Jesus said, Jesus Iscariot? I, no, no, there's something strange about him. My spirit just doesn't like him at all. And I want you to have him. And he was a devil from the beginning. And, you know, it makes me wonder to think about that. I had for years I thought about it. Then I, I saw so many witnesses. It was, it, was very, it was very important that Jesus walk in the open universe. And in my life, there were times when people would come together. At my house, at times, just show up. And there was a witness for a person that was there that had to do certain things, was going to do certain things, whether they did it or not. There was a witness. Now, I, I, there are many times I knew it was eternal. This is going to be done later. Later on, people are going to go to court on this thing. It's spiritual, legislative. Uh, I, Jesus walks through the same thing. I'm not saying we're, we're like Jesus, but we are in his kingdom. The same rules apply to you. There are things that you have to do as well. He asked you to be holy, for he is holy. He wasn't asking you to be this perfect person. He's asking you to walk uprightly before him as a vessel before him in the kingdom of God before him. Now, righteousness and holiness and morals, those all go with it. But there was something he walked in that he had to have Judas Iscariot to look after. That was evil. It was just evil. Judas was evil. And he had to be exposed to the full the full witness and judgment of the universe. The angels had to watch. Archangels had to see him. Demons had to see him. Devils had to see him. Fallen angels had to see him. People had to see him. Women and men had to see him. And children. Everybody had to see him. It had to be open, completely open. Nothing closed. Nothing hidden. And for three and a half years, Judas not only was a disciple, but he was a secretary treasurer. He had the money belt. And he dipped into the, the bag occasionally and bought things. And just spent money. What? So whatever. And when the time came at the end, and you could imagine Jesus sitting in on all the council. He was the top dog there. He was on he was on all Jesus' private discussions and subjects. He watched Jesus deal with women. That's a touchy area, uh, especially for in the East. And as our soldiers have fought out the last 30 years, 20 years in Saudi Arabia and other places, a Jew didn't talk to a woman publicly and listen, not even his own wife. But Jesus talked openly. The disciples were shocked when they found him at the well talking to the woman. You talk, what are you talking to her for? Oh. Not only that, but, but uh, some of us don't even realize this. Jesus had women traveling with him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What scandals, huh? But he was pure in his moral integrity. He was just pure. That even that breaking of a cultural norm, the customs are broken, norms are broken. We talked with women. It didn't break the integrity of his purity and who he is. It didn't. But not only that, this devil who sat on the council with him, of the disciples, for three and a half years, when it came to the end, when it really came to the end, and he betrayed Jesus, it was done. And he rushed out into the night, and he threw that money down before him, and he ran out crying and screaming, I have betrayed innocent blood. He's innocent. I betrayed him. He had to say it. Hell had to testify to that. The, integ the integrity and the impeccability, impeccableness of, of Jesus and his purity. Hell bore witness too. Everybody bore witness. I've seen the minimum, of, seen little things like that, but I've seen it. Now, Judas is out. He's gone. Yeah, they need another apostle to fill it up, so uh, that governmental number of 12 that we have in the kingdom. So Acts 22, we're told that they had to find somebody who, quote, beginning from the baptism of John till, till that same date when he was taken up from us, somebody needs to be ordained. One needs to be ordained to be a witness with them. Uh, apostles of the Lamb, of his resurrection. His resurrection. Uh, his resurrection. Now, that's significant. It wasn't enough that he witnessed the cross, right? No. It's not what they said. And they're not minimizing that. 
But one of the things that's very concerning is that is uh, in evangelicalism, it just stops at the cross. We need to find out the resurrection. In these altar calls we have, we have to have that more and more. And we don't have that. I watch this sorrowful. We get everybody's sympathy and let's go. Raise your hand up. So No, no. What's going to happen if we actually preach the real thing? We need a big, bigger and better theology to undergird that. Now, if we experience this experiential, look, there are, there are thousands and thousands of Christians who gave their entire hope to eternal life to the cross. The cross without the resurrection is just, uh, it is it is a, a rough gospel. I mean, it's sad. It's all negative. There's no positive there. Number, number, number two, mediatorial kingship, number two. Now, turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Let's read, let's read a few verses. Acts 2 and verse 29. Man and brethren, you all have that? Man and brethren, let me freely speak unto you that uh, about our original father Adam. About the father of faith, Abraham. About the uh, other church leader, Moses. Now, who does he want to talk about? Who? There are four men in the Old Testament that you and I relate to symbolically. Four prominent men. And I've mentioned them several times before. When the Apostle Paul wants to talk about, in, in terms of racial, or race... There's only two races uh, in history right now, the Adamic race and the Christ race. So in the fifth chapter of Romans, when the Apostle Paul wants to talk about racial issues, he talks about Adam as the progenitor of, of the first race and Christ as the progenitor of the second race. And in his epistle to the Corinthians, he said, as in Adam all men died, so in Christ all live. Everybody's in, everybody's in Adam or in Christ. Therefore, Adam is an important symbolic person to us racially. Racially. Literation. We relate to Adam racially, and that's a, a big issue, a large issue. The new man and the old man. And where you are, it has to do with the Mosaic Church and the Christ Church. This, this is big. This is part of our bigness. Now, the second one we relate to is Abraham. When Paul wants to talk about individual justification, when he wants to talk about an individual relationship with God, in the fourth chapter of Romans, he talks about Abraham. Now, if we relate to Adam racially, and then we relate to Abraham relationally and redemptively. Now, whenever you want to talk about justification, you talk about Abraham. Now, that's who David talked about. And Paul talked about him. Abraham is the, the 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 point of a heathen rejustified by accepting the word of God and running with it and accepting it for righteousness. Now, that's the whole Old Testament basis for Paul's doctrine of justification. By faith. Abraham believed it and it was given to him by faith. That's Abraham. Moses. Now, how do you relate to Moses? Now, it's already been quoted in the seminar. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, how that all of our fathers were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food, meat and drink, they drink the same spiritual drink, but with the majority of them, God was not well pleased, wasn't happy with them, and they had perished in the wilderness. Now, they're all witnesses, examples for us until the ends of the ages come upon us, that we can learn not to do that, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that. Don't do it. Don't do the same thing they did, and reap the same thing they reaped. Now, how come he brought Moses into this? Why did he just bring in Adam? Adam had, didn't have a church, he had a race. Why didn't he bring Abraham into it? Abraham didn't have a church either. He had a family. And we got to look at him as the individual believer. That's what we look at him as. Now, when do we start to find community? When do we find that? We don't find community until Moses forms a community 
out of Sinai with his own constitution given by God, and he becomes the constitu- constitutional divine community. It's an extension of the law of God on the earth. That's what that we were. So we want to wa- we want to talk relationally. The third R relationally. We talk Moses relationally. Our relationship. Now we come into the the, the kingdom business. Saul who failed, David who was a man after God's own heart, and David becomes the Old Testament picture of an ideal king. He did. The darling of God. Right in the Apostles' writings, he said that he was a man after God's own heart who does all his will for and And, and wills in the Greek plural. He does all his wills. This man was very close to God's heart. Now, God made a covenant with him, and the covenant with God, with David, was a covenant of the kingdom. And the covenant of the kingdom was uh, that of ruling or reigning. And so we relate to David regally, royally. You know, we relate to him in, in terms of of uh, rulership. He's in charge, you know, power. It holds a pull, different slant on things in, in uh, inflection on Pentecost outpouring. I think by and large, we have missed theoretically the... Uh, Maybe experientially we picked up on it more, but we got more ruling than we know. But we have missed the whole thrust theologically, I believe. A lot of it, the last 20 years have been better. On the day of Pentecost, Peter had, was talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He relates that whole thing to David. Not Adam, not Abraham, not Moses, but David. Told David. When the promise of God in the Davidic covenant says this, I'll raise up one from David's loins to sit on your throne. That's physically. And then Peter goes on to say, but but David was a prophet. And David prophesied. Let's, let's go to those verses real quick. Verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up. Mashiach. Everywhere you read Christ, where, where was you? The, he's the anointed ruler, Mashiach. He's the one, the Christ, the one's coming. And there's some translations, uh, I like them because they actually consistently translating Christ as the Messiah. It's much easier if they just, if they just, if we understood that, the definition of a Messiah means, means uh, the ruler, the anointed one. He's the king, he's the anointed king. He is. He's it. The day of Pentecost relates then to uh, the covenant of David, and that David foresaw. He saw these things coming, and David foresaw the Messiah, the Messiah. The fruit of his loins would be the ultimate king. That's what he saw. David saw this, and David prophesied it. He reached forward and saw this. Now God was going to raise him up. Oh, people who read that in the Old Testament, God raised up to sit on his throne. Would they think of resurrection? Not too much. No, they didn't. A few people saw a little bit of it, but it wasn't big in the Old Testament too much. They didn't teach it much. He's going to raise him up. He's going to come up through the ranks, and, and there is king. Raise him up, right? No. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter said this. He uh, interpreted it properly. Are we reading this now? He seeing this before spake of what? The resurrection. The resurrection. It's what he spoke of, the resurrection. What was it? The resurrection. Now, on heaven's throne this evening, right now, there's one according to the flesh of David's loins. Yeah, he's a man. Now, let's go intimately. Right now, sitting on the throne of the cosmos is one of us, one human being. Very wonderful. One of us used to attend our synagogue down in Nazareth. He used to be here, worked in the shop, took care of his mama. Mary's boy, Jesus of Nazareth. And that is disrespectful, right? No, it's not. It's necessary to adjust our thinking about humanity and deity both. 
and uh, we keep losing his humanity, it, it makes him one with us as humanity. And thank God. I, I thank God for his humanity. When years ago, I thank God had cried out to him, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are a man, you're on the throne, and, and you'll save us from all these boogers out here. I don't understand why he didn't kill Satan in the first place, but here we are. Now, Job said that. I wish there was somebody could somebody could come between us. A day's man is called. He would talk for me and talk for you, talk for me. He's talking to God, and he said, I'm desperate. I got balls all over me, and I need to know what's going on. I'm sick, and I need to know what's going on. I want to stop right here for just a moment and, and listen to me. If you're believing God for healing, you're believing God for prosperity, you're believing God for these things, and you're you're filling yourself up with the Word, that gives you hope and gives you faith. You already have faith that's been given to you. Faith was dropped into your heart when you got saved and born again, and then doubt may be in your head, but there's faith in your heart. Now, you won't know it necessarily if you build yourself up and you're listening to tapes and you listen to to the Word, you listen to CDs, you listen to right now, it's MP3s and waves, whatever, digital. At some point, you're going to have to get hold of God. You're going to have to talk to Jesus. He is the mediator for your faith. He's in heaven right now talking to God the Father, mediating for you. When he looks at you, he sees the blood. That's it. It's your, he's, he tells the Father, that's my child. Yeah, that's that's my baby talking right there. That's my child. You need to talk to them about your sickness and disease and say, I, I, just, I need to talk to you. I need to discuss this with you. Now, he may talk back to you and say, you know, by Jesus stripes you're healed or he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and chastised for our pieces on him, and by his stripes we were healed. There is there is something else, too. You need to discuss and talk with him. You could talk to him, and he could talk back to you. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's a rima, too. It is amazing when God speaks to you and tells you something. And some of you who are, are sick, you're real sick. You need to talk to God. You need to talk to Jesus. Not God, the God Almighty. Well, everybody talks to God. God bless you. God this. God. It's, say Jesus. Say him. And it just makes things shake. I've cast demons out of people, and they're talking to me. And I used the name of Jesus on them, and I used it hard and good. And they would always tell me he didn't exist. He didn't die on the cross. He, they hate the name of Jesus. And when I would tell somebody on the street, just Jesus, God bless you, that's just fine with them. But you say, Jesus bless you and keep you. Boy, I'm undone. That name, which is above all names, is either good or bad. They're going to love you or hate you. So those of you who are believing for healing, believing for prosperity, believing for things, you get that hope in your heart. You read those scriptures where it says that you can have healing, where it says that he'll prosper you, where it says he'll take care of you, that he'll look after you. In life or death, you live by faith and you die in faith. But you better get hold of him. It's a man who we're worshiping, not a word. It's a man that we're after, not a word. But that word has to be in there concerning his promises and what he said. That is the mind of the Holy Spirit. But you need to talk to God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, here on this earth. Talk to the Lord. He'll put that word inside of you. Then you'll you'll have that, that fear will leave and that faith will start coming up harder and harder through the word. Talk to him. Pray it back to him. Pray to that word. Talk to the word. Pray it out. Talk to God about it. Talk to God about it and hear from him. You may need to hear from him more than one time. Hear from him. You have a relationship with him. You have a right. He made it a right for you to come to him. Come to the throne of God boldly in time of need. In time of need. Now, that was just a freebie. But that's what you do. There's times I prayed up to 14, 15 hours because I was being attacked so severely in my body. Or rather things happened and I had to have money. I had to have things to pay the bills and take care of things. I would pray. I would pray. This whole world was against me. It just is against you. If you're Christ, it's, the world is against you. But you overcame the world by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, and you know, love not your life unto death. It's already happened. You're here for a reason. He'll take care of you. Now go talk to him. Visit with him. And you're going to get tired and get up and do it again. Do it again until you hear him distinctly say to you, I love you. My word is true. You're healed. Now run with it. Well, I'll tell you, it changes your life because there's a, a faith that's built up inside you. It comes to life. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. I don't know how to explain it to you. It's like a helicopter that comes flying over you and faith dropped into you. That's the best thing I can say.
When I was in college, I had some trouble with math, certain math, and I was I just wasn't getting it. I got the formulas all right, but I didn't see it in my mind too much. I went and asked one of my professors and said, that I'm not getting this. It's just not dropping down. Something's wrong. He said, I want you to study this over and over and over again. Study it until you're sick of it. Study it again over and over and over and over and over. Go through the formula. Do it over and over and over, and then it'll click. Day 21, it clicked. <laughs> I understood it, but I wasn't going to quit. If I'd have quit on day 20, guess what? I wouldn't have got it. I remember when the Lord spoke to me, I was being harassed by demons so hard. The oppression was so thick. I had studied New Age. I studied witchcraft. I studied everything. And when you do that, and then you turn your life around, and Jesus comes and gets you, and you know about those things, they're getting mad at you. It's not like, you know, da 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 everything's great, it's wonderful. No, it wasn't. I had a, a, few, a few hours and days of great times in the Holy Spirit, and those things came. And I asked the Lord, how do I get rid of this stuff up? And he said to me, in prayer, he said, just like everything cleared, he just spoke to me. Say this out loud with your mouth. You're washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You're washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And I said, that's it? Yeah, study it and say it. I'm washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So I read and I found and I spoke. I spoke all the time. I spoke at work. I spoke quietly. I spoke. I didn't look like a weirdo because I was anyway. I spoke. I remember I was in my backyard around the apricot trees in the orchard. And I was underneath a large apricot tree by the ditch. It was evening, four o'clock. It was beautiful it was in Utah. It was a gorgeous day. Then all of a sudden, something hit me in the top of my head that felt like warm honey. It's just sweet and lovely. went through my whole body slowly, like electricity went through me and over me, on the top of me. When it was done, that horrible harassment oppression was gone. That's 17 days. I wasn't going to quit. I asked him how long. I never got an answer. It was like, this is it. You keep <laughs> keep going. You proclaim it. You are washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I proclaimed it. It's 17 days. Maybe your prosperity comes in four, five, one, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year for somebody. I don't know. But you don't quit. You proclaim and you claim and say what he said. He did these things for you legally, judiciously. In heaven is written before you were ever born, it was done. You just have to run with them now and claim them. The Holy Spirit is here for you. The Holy Spirit is the only Jesus you'll know right now. The Holy Spirit is the only God the Father you'll know. The Holy, the Holy Spirit is the only heaven you'll know. The Holy Spirit, you, you get the word through the Holy Spirit. You Before you were born again and received the Holy Spirit, you didn't know nothing about the Bible. You could do worldly studies on it. it would teach you more unbelief that you could never reach. The, the, the word studies were horrible. Anyway, I should bring you back to this, the resurrection. This is all the resurrection. If 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 you if you received everything that was on the cross, everything was done on the cross. Thank God for the cross, but it's all negative. By His stripes you were healed. This is all dependent on the resurrection. Every promise you get from Him, a prosperity, uh, brother. I'd rather I, I'd, I want to see you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. But you're not going to prosperity is not going to be yours as long as the devil takes it away from you. And you're not saying it, speaking it, and doing it, and believing it. He wants you to prosper. He doesn't want you to not prosper. Well, how is he going to do that? I don't know. I don't know how he's going to do that for you. I don't care if a puppy dog comes along carrying a bag full of money and drops it to you. He'll do it legally. He'll get it to you. I wouldn't worry about it too much. I just start believing it, start saying it. He wants you to prosper. Abraham was wealthy. All these men were wealthy. They showed God to the world by prosperity and health and, and healing. There are times you won't. There are times when I've had friends of mine or ministers of mine and myself too. You get fought. They'll fight you. They'll kill you. If they can, they will. There'll be a lot who have died. There's a lot who are going to die because this is not just prosperity and healing and all the good stuff that goes along with it. It's not just that. There are things you have to do. And in that having to do, you might end up living in a cave. <laughs> you might end up living on the road. You might end up being whipped and beat for your faith, but you don't give up. How many kids have been killed by saying, do you, you know, somebody pointing a gun at them saying, uh, tell me you love Jesus. You love Jesus? I do love Jesus. A bang, you shot him. That just happened recently in America. That's happened all over the world. 
persecution, death. So whole church has been killed and burned up for their, for, for, for their faith. They, they're not going to give up their faith. They won't do it. You're not supposed to either when it comes right down to it. But for those of you who believe in God for health, prosperity in your life right now, you talk to the Lord. Talk to Jesus. Not only that, tell, read back to him. You said this to you, and I thank you, Lord. I, I want that. I need that in my body. I need that in my mind. I need your spirit to go through my mind. Just like Mike said. Just like Paul said. Just like your word said. Get anointed with oil by the... Do what the word said to do. If anyone's sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church and let them anoint them with oil. The elders. Now that's people who believe in it. Don't grab a bunch of people who don't believe in it. I've had a lot of Baptist friends that go forward and want prayed. We don't, we don't do that here. Go find someone who does do that who believes in that, who talks in tongues, and don't go back to that church that's dead. If you go back to a church that, now I'm not trying to be mean, but if you go to a church of people who don't believe those things, that's what you're going to get. Unbelief. Pain. They stop at the cross, and they don't go any further. Well, that's kind of mean. <laughs> I don't mean to upset people or rub you the wrong way. Even if I hadn't experienced these things, I would teach it. Because the Word says it. All through and through, the, the Bible says that. If you have a, a, a high, high priest that will take care of you, you need to go to him. Now, I want you to remember this. Those of you that are going after this, or those of you that aren't, I don't know how you stumble on this, you may not be born again. You need to tell the Lord Jesus. I don't necessarily believe in you, but if you are, look, let me tell you, the Lord wants you saved. That's why he did this with Jesus. That's why Jesus did everything that he did. I don't know why there's such an enemy here doing what he's doing. I don't know what happened behind the scenes there. I don't know. I can't tell you. I can tell you biblically what I think happened. Well, okay. Well, that that's just, this, is how, this is how it is. I mean, I've told people before, this is how it is. The devil is here. His name is Satan. He does this. He's a fallen angel. He took a third of the angels with him. I don't know why they're down here. I don't know what God's trying to prove to them. I don't know all the legalities that he was here, fallen already. And God made man, and man wasn't wise yet because he had he was full grown, but he didn't have any years behind him. That takes some wisdom. And God didn't download a bunch of wisdom into him. I mean, he should have gave him a 30 out 6 or 30 or something to kill that snake and said anything comes in the snake, comes in the garden you don't like, it doesn't, shouldn't be here, to shoot it. And um, it should have happened, but it didn't. And there are many times that I've said, you know, you, you should have killed him. You should have killed him dead. But he didn't. He's waiting for us to do something about it, and we do. I've given you all authority and all power, therefore you go. Don't forget Jesus' humanity. He lived here as a baby. He grew up as a young man. He helped with his mama. His daddy died and couldn't raise him from the dead. There were things he had to learn, things he had to do. In humility, his humbleness, he went to the cross for us. He bore those things for us. But if he would have risen from the dead, these wouldn't be available for you. By Jesus' stripes, you are healed. That's available for you. The power of the Holy Spirit is here for you. The Holy Spirit makes everything in the Word come true for you. He shows you heaven. You can't even know heaven unless you're born again. Can't see it. Can't know it. He wants to talk to you. He wants to help you. He wants to be with you. He loves you. Go to him and talk to him about these things. Like a man talks to a man, a woman talks to a woman. Go talk to him. Discuss with him the word of what it says. Now, if you're not born again, get born again. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Please regenerate me. Just like the Bible says, just like what Mike is saying right now, because Mike's not lying. I'm not lying. Say what the Word says. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I will get baptized in water. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I don't have to have a bunch of feelings about it, but it'd be nice. I, I, I want you to wash my sins away. Wash the edemic sin away. Wash my sins away. Clean me, Lord. I ask you to clean me. You're the only one that can. Lord Jesus, you are a man. You went through everything that we go through, yet without sin, so you could lead the way. I receive you right now. I receive you. I receive you. I receive you. If you have to say that you received Jesus 300 times, even on your deathbed, I have received Jesus. You received him one time. Then you have received Jesus and the fullness of the Spirit. You have to say it. Say it all the time. Say it. I am washed and cleansed with the blood of Jesus. I am filled with his Holy Spirit. I am filled with his power. I am filled with his love. Say it and proclaim it. I am healed by his stripes. And Lord Jesus, I thank you and I praise you and I worship you. 
and talk to the Lord. Good morning, Lord. How are you? Hello, Lord Jesus. How are you doing? The devil will mimic him. He'll mock him. He's a liar. The word says that my sheep know my voice and the voice of a stranger they won't heed. You can't do that unless you hear his voice again and again and again. When a shepherd went out and talked to his sheep, he talked to them all the time. They learned his voice. That's that's my shepherd. And they'll come to him. He calls them to come. Hey, 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 come. And they come to him. They don't come to a stranger. Uh, somebody comes out there and screams, come, 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 and don't sound like him. We ain't going to him. Well, that's what you have to do, too. Odds and ends. Tidbits. Father, I receive you in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus is Lord. This is Mike. I'll see you next time.